Uh, I've been asked to talk about the effects of um, the new markets on the, on the total supply-demand balance, and uh, I, I will be repeating some of the slides you've seen from, from some other people, but I think what you can say about the coffee market, if you look over the last 20 years, the growth has been very dynamic, and it's increased over the last decade. So if we went back from uh, 1990 to 2000, I've got two periods there, you could say from 1990 to 95, consumption growth was about 1% a year. From 95 to 2000, it rose to about 1.8. Uh, when you went past 2000, for the next five years, growth was almost 2.5% a year, and now it's settled around 2% uh, growth per annum. It, it's growing very quickly. Um, and then if you look at where that growth has occurred from, um, when I say producers, it means emerging markets, so uh, forgive me for a mistake on the slide, but if you look at the mature markets, the mature markets I've called uh, Western Europe, North America and Japan, uh, that's the blue line, and, and you can see that there's been very limited growth uh, in those markets over the last 20 years. But virtually all the growth uh, has been in these emerging markets uh, everywhere else. I mean, you can, you can, it's, it's virtually do well, it's more than doubled uh, consumption in those markets over the last 20 years. And, and if you look at which countries has it um, grown in, I've just split there between. Um, coffee producing countries and uh, non-coffee producing emerging markets, but this is all just emerging markets. I'd say in, in both cases you can see that um, the consumption has doubled, both in the coffee producing countries and in the non-coffee uh, producing countries. And the rate of growth uh, in the non-coffee producing countries uh, has been greater than that of the producing countries, but it's come from a lower base. <coughs> So if I put the, put the totals together, if you look at the, the blue circles, it showed demand in the, um, in the mature markets. So that's moved from about 60 to, to 70 million bags over the last 20 years. Uh, if you look at the yellow dots, uh, the producing countries, well, consumption there has moved from about 20 million to approaching 40 million uh, bags per year. Uh, and if you look at the other emerging markets, uh, it's risen from about 10 million to, uh, to about 25 million. Uh, bags per year. Um, and I think it, what's interesting, if you look at the, the size of the dots, if you said that the mature markets in, in 1990 accounted for roughly two-thirds uh, of, uh, of consumption, well now it's nearer 50-50 uh, with the emerging markets. Uh, and, and if you translate that into number of bags, roughly I think you can say that consumption is growing by about uh, two, two and a half million bags uh, per year. Again, the majority of that consumption, roughly 80% of that growth, uh, is being taken by the emerging markets. Roughly 1 million bags is being added by producers, a year, uh, producing countries a year, uh, and about uh, 800,000 to 900,000 bags have been accounted for by these uh, other emerging markets. So when, when you look at the supply-demand balance, in a way production needs to increase by 2, 2.5 million bags per year uh, to keep growth. Uh, with the trend we're seeing in the growth in consumption. Again, 80% of that consumption uh, is in emerging markets. And, and there are many reasons why that, um, uh, that growth in emerging markets is occurring. And, and one of them I would point out is that I think the growth in incomes, I think that is probably the key driver uh, in emerging market coffee consumption growth. Incomes have risen, uh, so the affordability uh, of coffee has, has, has risen. And, and each of the, the dots on the chart just shows a different country uh, plotting per capita income uh, against per capita consumption. And you can see as, the, as income rises, so per capita consumption uh, rises. The dots aren't exactly on the line, there's more things going on, but roughly you can say that as per capita income rises, uh, so consumption rises. And also I think the thing you can say is the curve is much steeper at lower income levels. So it only requires a relatively small increase in income at low income levels to generate a large increase in, uh, in consumption. If you're at the, the far end of the curve on the higher income levels, uh, the slope of that curve is a lot less. Um, the markets approach uh, a saturation uh, level. So in a way, it doesn't matter so much what happens to the level of income. Your potential for growth in potential consumption is a lot less marked uh, than it is in the emerging markets. The other thing I think you can, can say from that as well is that although we've seen all this growth in emerging markets, actually when you look at per capita consumption levels overall, they're still relatively low. 
Um, there's a lot of countries on the bottom of this chart, so it's probably not uh, that clear to see. But if, if you go to some of the northern European countries, you look at uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway, uh, you have per capita co consumption levels of around, I don't know, between 8 and 10 uh, kilos a year. Um, you have another band of countries between 8 and, eight and 6, uh, and you'll see that Brazil um, is, is one of the emerging markets that's entered, entered that band. Uh, then you have a lot of countries around 4, which tend to be your, your higher income uh, emerging markets. But then you go right the way down to countries with less than two, less than one, uh, you know, less, less than one kilo uh, per capita. In those markets, you're seeing high growth of income. You're seeing potential for um, sustained growth in, uh, in coffee consumption. So even though we've seen all that growth over the last 10 years, in per capita terms, it's still relatively small which makes you think that for the future, the, the outlook or the prospect for, for more growth in the emerging markets remains uh, very strong. And I, th I think what, what tends to happen is that, and this is true of coffee and uh, another other, uh, other commodities as well, is that the consumption growth follows what um, people would call an S-curve. It starts off at very low levels, it then goes into a phase of rapid acceleration, and then it comes to a period of, of stagnation. Uh, and what I think you're seeing in many of the emerging markets is they're, they're entering into this, this period of, of rapid takeoff. But your know, income started to grow, you're seeing very quick uh, increases in per capita consumption, and that will continue up that curve until you reach uh, a level of, of stagnation. This is actual data from, uh, from Japan uh, to, to give you an idea about what happened to, um, to consumption in that market, and you can see that. You know, from the 1950s through to 65, you had very slow growth. You're on the slow stage of, of, of the consumption curve. From 65 up to 2000, you had this rapid increase uh, in consumption of what you're seeing uh, in, in other emerging markets now. And then it, it flattens off. Um, and I think what you can, can say is that the level that it flattens off varies between country. So in, in somewhere like Japan, it's, it's flattened off around <coughs> four and a half uh, kilos per, per capita. Somewhere like Brazil, we're already at six, and it's still going up on, on the rapid stage uh, of, of the curve. Whereas other markets will, will converge or, or stagnate at uh, lower levels of capita income. I've said that I think income is an important uh, driver of consumption, but so are tastes. Um, the, the taste for, for, for coffee against other beverages is obviously a very important driver. Here I've just put about soluble. We, we've talked a bit about soluble. Uh, and one of the important things you see about soluble is that it's a very strong correlation uh, between uh, tea consumption and soluble coffee consumption. <coughs> so if you look along the, uh, the vertical, uh, the horizontal axis, I've just put the capita tea consumption, and then going up the, uh, the vertical axis, the proportion of soluble in consumption. And you see quite a good good relationship that uh, the more tea people consume. Uh, the more soluble coffee people consume. So, you know, that tends to be uh, people's first take uh, into, into coffee. So when you look at some of the, uh, the emerging Asian markets, it's not surprising in those markets, often instant coffee is the first uh, coffee that people, people ta uh, try because of its, um, I suppose, closeness in preparation to tea is probably the best way that I would, I would put it. You know, people, you, you, in a way, you brew instant coffee in a similar way to, to tea and that tends to be the way that people first get into, um, into drinking coffee in those markets. Um, but, it, but it's also tastes are an issue as well, and I think one thing you do find is that in coffee producing countries, you tend to see a higher level of per capita consumption than you do in non-coffee uh, non consuming countries. And, and here I've just put uh, the income relationship in, in the line, and above it you see the American producing countries, uh, the Asian producing countries, their level of, uh, of per capita coffee consumption is higher than that which you see in comparable um, uh, coffee consuming countries, non-producing countries. And I think that was what was mentioned before, that people have a, uh, an affinity to coffee in producing countries, that it's easier to sell uh, coffee consumption to, cons uh, to consumers in coffee producing countries because they know coffee but, than it is in, uh, in new markets uh, where they, they do not have a history uh, of coffee. The other thing I would say about the emerging markets is there's a high proportion of robusta consumption in those markets. Uh, so if you look uh, here, again, I've just split out the mature, the producers, and the other emerging markets. Uh, you can say in the mature markets, 
roughly 30% of, of a blend or total consumption uh, is, is robusta. When you move to both producing countries and emerging markets, that proportion is much higher. Um, it's approaching 50% uh, of total consumption will be, um, will be robusta. Um, and I think that there's two reasons that account for that. One is a high proportion of soluble consumption uh, in those markets. Uh, and in case of, of Brazil, I think a lot of that has to do with the growth of Conlon production. Uh, a lot of it, there's been a huge increase of Conlon production, the majority of which has gone into, um, it, into the local market. But I think in, in, because of the high proportion of soluble, also because of price, it produces a cheaper beverage than an Arabica-based beverage. So for a low-income uh, low consumer, it makes an affordable beverage. Uh, you see a, a much higher uh, proportion of robusta in consumption than you do in the emerging markets. So when you look at those charts about um, consumption, this is just for Robusta, uh, what you do find is that the, emer the consumption in the emerging markets of Robusta uh, is approachable. If you combine the producers and the other emerging together, the uh, consumption of Robusta in the emerging markets is greater than that than in the mature markets. So you've seen a very rapid <coughs> increase of robusta consumption uh, in those markets, whereas the growth of in, in the mature markets uh, has been more steady. But the, the one thing I would say about the, the mature markets, um, and this is the only thing I'd say about the mature markets, is that you tend to find more flexibility um, in, in blends, particularly over the last two or three years. So although that chart showed uh, robust around 30%. <coughs> I think when you look over the last couple of years, because of the, the high arbitrage, you've seen a big increase in robust consumption in the developed markets. And this just shows um, imports into the, uh, into the EU. And, and you can see that if you went back, uh, I don't know, 2006 to 2009, roughly 35% of imports were, were robust. Well, over the last couple of years, that's risen to 40, 45% of imports because the arbitrage was so great you saw some switching in blends to encourage the use of Robusta um, to the detriment of, of washed coffees. And I think you probably see more of that in the developed markets than you do in the emerging markets. Uh, and I think I would say that probably you see less flexibility in the blends uh, in the producing countries because producing countries tend to consume their own coffee rather than import coffee. So you see a lot less trade in coffees between producing countries, except in the case of where they're soluble manufacturers and then you're importing Robusta for, for soluble manufacturer. But I think you see less, less flexibility there uh, than you do in the consuming markets. So that, that's my very brief run through of, of what I see, what we see happening in, in the emerging markets. Just to summarize, I think I'd say consumption is growing around two and a half, uh, by two and a half million bags a year. The majority of that, around 2 million bags of that, uh, is accounted for by, by emerging markets. That's both producing countries and uh, non-producing uh, emerging markets. Uh, incomes, and I think rising per capita incomes, are the, are the key and the, and the most important driver uh, of that growth. And also because of um, the importance of soluble, you're starting from relatively low incomes, Robusta is an important part of that consumption, and Robusta accounts for, for just over half, almost 60% uh, of that growth. Thank you very much.